Welcome back, everybody. It's Mr. Alviar, back for another chapter of Capitan Trouble Creek by Gene Van Leeuwen. I'll be reading chapter 19 tonight, and if you remember, I know it's been a while, I left off uh, at the end of chapter 18, where Daniel sensed that someone was watching him. And he just was getting ready to turn around when he realizes who it is. Here we are, chapter 19. <clears throat> It was so good to see Solomon standing there. Just as before, he seemed to have simply appeared out of the woods. He looked exactly the same, straight and tall and still dressed in his deerskins, as if it had only been yesterday that they'd said goodbye. White boys are catching fish! Solomon spoke as if it really had been yesterday. Not today, Daniel answered, but other days. He brought up the line to show Solomon his homemade fishing hook. Solomon nodded. Good hook. Catch as many fish. Daniel felt warmed by his praise, but he found himself strangely tongue-tied. It had been so long since he'd spoken to anyone but Will. Solomon spoke instead. Where is brother? he asked. Uh, Will went to check the rabbit snares, said Daniel. And Papa and Mama, they come? Daniel shook his head. Solomon looked at him silently for a long moment. So, white boys alone all winter? Yes. Daniel saw that Solomon was gazing at his blanket coat, and suddenly his tongue came untied. Uh, we made these coats and mittens from the rabbit fur, and Will figured out how to make snowshoes, and then the wolves killed the deer right by the cabin, so we had all that meat and the hide, too. <laughs> he was babbling now, spilling out everything that had happened since last fall. Solomon listened quietly, nodding every now and then, and when Daniel finally stopped for a breath, he said, Boys, learn. That is good. <laughs> he hadn't called them white boys this time, Daniel noticed. Maybe they had earned a little bit of the Indians' respect, Daniel thought. Will suddenly appeared carrying a dead rabbit by its ears. His face lit up at the sight of Solomon. He wasn't tongue-tied at all, but immediately showed him his moccasins with their rabbit fur liners. They're the best shoes I've ever had, he said. My feet were warm all winter. Chimamus is small, said Solomon, but he gives much meat and fur. Daniel wanted to ask so many questions of Solomon. Why was he here? Had he come to do more trapping, or maybe just to see if he and Will were all right? And how long was he going to stay? but he knew Solomon would tell them whatever he wanted them to know in his own time. So he didn't ask. And Solomon told them nothing more that day. Soon, with a wave of his hand, he disappeared into the trees. For two days, the boys looked for Solomon, but he did not appear. So they did some more fishing. The ice in the creek had finally melted and the water was running fast. Again and again, Daniel let down his line, but nothing seemed to be biting this time. Will, fishing spear in his hand, was about to step into the cold water when a quiet voice behind them said, Klahi Khan, catch more fish. What did that mean, Daniel wondered. Klahi Khan. A trap, said Will. For fish? I show you how said Solomon. He showed them how to make a trap of thin sticks, woven together so that one end was wide and the other end was closed. He placed the opened end in the water, at a place where large rocks narrowed the creek, creating a little riffle between the, the pools. Fish swim in, cannot get out, Solomon explained. Daniel understood. Why hadn't they thought of that? Just as with the rabbit snares and the turkey trap, 
they could have this fish trap working for them while they did their other things. And as he had last fall, Solomon would suddenly appear and as suddenly be gone. Some days he talked to the boys and even made one of his small jokes. At other times, Daniel noticed that Solomon hardly spoke at all, as if some dark mood had crept over him. Well, the days grew warmer. The last patches of snow melted quickly. and Daniel noticed tiny buds beginning to appear on some of the trees. Soon those buds would turn into leaves, and everywhere that he looked, bits of green were poking up out of the ground. Plants seemed to be lifting themselves out of their long winter sleep. Some of the plants could be eaten, Solomon told them. And one afternoon, he walked with the boys through the woods and along the creek, picking up a leaf here, uh, slicing a root with his knife there. Daniel remembered a few of the plants from Ma's kitchen, the wild onion, which Solomon called Wi Nun Chi. Looked different, but it smelled just the same as Ma's. Most of the plants, though, he'd never thought of eaten, like the ferns that had just started to spring up next to the creek, and the tiny violets that were popping out everywhere. Now they were going to have greens to add to their next rabbit stew. Solomon also pointed out poisonous plants. Bad in belly, he said holding his stomach in such a comical way that the boys had to laugh. But they stopped abruptly when Solomon said, If you eat, maybe you die. He showed them healing plants as well, some wild herbs and roots. Basin, Solomon called them, which Daniel decided must mean medicine. The bark of certain trees could be boiled in water to make a curing drink, he told the boys, or you could apply it to the skin to heal a wound. Pointing out a butternut tree, he said, This fixes pain in head or tooth. Daniel wondered if these remedies would really work. But Ma had her own cures made from herbs like feverfew for headaches and hyssop for coughs and tansy tea for stomach aches. Maybe these weren't so different from hers. After that day, many days went by without seeing Solomon. Once again, Daniel was concerned that something might have happened to him. But then he dismissed his worries. In some strange way, Daniel thought, Solomon reminded him of Pa. They were both so strong and certain about things, and both knew so much. Solomon was part of the forest. Nothing in it could harm him, Daniel thought. He'd be back. Well, he came again on the warmest day yet. The sun was shining and the boys hardly needed their blanket coats. For the first time, Daniel could make out the soft green of new leaves on the little dogwood tree near the cabin. He saw more splashes of green all around them, breaking up the dull brown of winter, as he and Will walked down the path to check their fish trap. They were in luck. Two small trout and a crawfish were caught neatly inside the trap, unable to find their way out, just like Solomon had said. As Daniel removed them, he noticed that one side of the trap had come apart, so he dragged it out and started reweaving it, while Will looked around for some sharp rocks. He was determined to make a good point for his large spear. Well, this time, Daniel sensed Solomon's presence before Solomon had a chance to speak. He turned around just as Solomon stepped out of the trees. Ah, said Solomon, good boy, here's like Indian. And a suggestion of a smile flickered across Solomon's face. Well, that was about the highest praise that Solomon could have given Daniel. And Daniel knew that. But today, Solomon seemed different, tired, and the lines in his face appeared to have grown deeper. It occurred to Daniel that he might be as old as Grandpap. 
Solomon watched without speaking as Daniel tied together the fish trap and set it back in the water. He showed Will how to make a spear point by tapping one rock against another, breaking off small pieces until finally he got the sharp point that he wanted. However, Solomon seemed distracted, as if his thoughts were somewhere else. At last, as Will sat patiently chipping away at his rock, Solomon spoke. I go find my old home, he said, gesturing upstream. In the direction of the horse mill, Daniel thought. Once upon a time, a big village was there. Many houses and canoes and horses. This was good land for hunting. Plenty of deer and beaver, fox and bear. And so many fish. They jump out of water into your hand. I wish to see it one more time. And then he stopped for a moment. And Daniel saw that his eyes were filled with sadness. All is gone now. Trees grow up. Nothing is left. Only this. And Solomon opened his hand and showed them a small, broken bit of a blackened clay pot. Part of cooking pot he said. Daniel suddenly remembered the two men that he met at the mill, Jake and Sam, boasting about their pa and uncles driving away the Indians. Why, they could have been talking about Solomon and his village. Daniel didn't even know what to say. Even Will was silent, chipping away at his rock, his head held down. Daniel had never imagined that whole villages had once stood here in the woods. From everything that he'd heard back in Pennsylvania, this new state of Ohio was unsettled. That was what Pa had said. That was what Pa had, why Pa had come here, wasn't it? And if that wasn't so, if, if the Indians had been here first... Why did they have to be driven out? In these vast woods, wasn't there enough land to share? I'm sorry, Solomon, Daniel said finally. It didn't seem like enough, but he just had to say something. Solomon shook his head. Boys did not burn our houses. Boys did not kill my father and brother. Boys did not kill the old people and the babies, too. He stopped speaking, looking off into the trees as if he was seeing once more what had taken place there long ago. And then he went on. My heart is bitter a long time. I want to hurt white men. I want to kill his father and his brother, kill many like they killed us. Daniel could picture that younger Solomon, his eyes gone hard, his body lean and strong, stealing through the woods to take his revenge. Now, Solomon continued, his voice quieter. I have no more anger. My heart is only sad. There seemed nothing more to say. Daniel stared at the little bit of clay pot in Solomon's hand, trying to imagine how he would feel if that was all that was left of his village. Three of them sat a few minutes more. Then Solomon rose slowly to his feet, and with his customary small wave of his hand, he disappeared into the trees of his old home. The 
people. I'll read chapter 20 tomorrow. <sighs> that chapter always makes me feel so, so sad. But there's a beauty to it as well. All of that heartache that Solomon goes through and remembering what happened all of those years ago with the the white men, the settlers, fighting and warring against the Native Americans. And being angry and, and wanting his revenge. And then he meets these two young white boys. And he feels sorry for them. And he helps them and they survive the winter. And Solomon doesn't have any more anger in his heart, just sadness. Maybe Daniel and Will had something to do with that. Maybe Solomon found peace in helping the two boys. Just maybe. There's so much that happened over the years with our country, so many terrible atrocities that, that happened to many different groups of people. I hope that eventually we all can heal from that. Well, thank you for listening, my friends. You know what time it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it's time. It's time for you to go and brush those teeth, wash your hands and your face, and get into your pajamas, kiss your parents goodnight, tell them you love them, tell your siblings you love them too, pet the dog, pet the cat, make sure they're settled in, get yourself into bed. Have a great night, everybody. Until tomorrow.